Well, good afternoon. Welcome to this edition of FinWeek Money Matters, the show that helps you manage your finances. I'm Samantha Loring, my co-host, Mark Ashton, editor of FinWeek. Well, on the show today, we're taking a look at this week's cover story, which investigates arguably the only three financial concepts you need to understand that's to get wealthy. In our investment section, we look at the pros and cons of property syndication in light of a vibrant rental market, which is attractive to those able to invest in property. And entrepreneur technology hubs are becoming Becoming incredibly popular in South Africa, also in Africa, as, as a matter of fact. And uh, we'll try to take a look at how these are being used to stimulate small businesses. That's in the entrepreneurship section. And uh, that's all coming up in the next hour, so stay tuned. And of course, if you have any comments or feedback for us, money matters at abn360.com is our email address. Well, many feel that the most powerful math in the world is not taught to 95% of students who enter the global workforce. The concepts of inflation, compound interest, and the discounted cash flow valuation are arguably the only three financial concepts you need to understand to get wealthy. And it's a cover story this week. Then week looks at these methods and explains why we're missing out. We're joined by Tanda Siswe, Mahluchana, Finweek Adepti Editor, Gareth Ush from ValuationApp.com. And joining us from our Cape Town studios, Stephen. Nathan, Chief Executive of 10X Investments. Uh, so welcome to the show again, Thanks. Mark. Good to have you back on the desk with us. Uh, so this was all inspired by an unnamed ex-Goldman Sachs banker. He wrote an article, uh, the math, uh, the most powerful math in the universe goes untaught. T tell us about that. Yeah, I saw this article get published last week on the Bankers Anonymous website. And essentially, he's an ex-Goldman Sachs banker. Uh, he's teaching finance to uh, finance students. And he walks in front of the class and he says, do any of you actually understand compound interest? How, do you, how does compound interest work? And everyone kind of says, yeah, they maybe they know. He says, do you know the formula for it? Nobody can give it to him. And then he says, well, do you understand what a discounted cash flow is? And most of them say no. And you know, if, if you start reading through the article, the point that he makes is that actually every all financial decisions, irrespective of whether you're buying shares or you're buying, running a business or you want to start a business, you need to understand these concepts. Mm -hmm. um, and you look in South Africa, what's the issue in South Africa? We don't understand the time value of money in mm -hmm. that we, we bury ourselves in debt, but we don't actually try and take it, you know, we don't try and get ahead of the cycle. We don't understand what it's doing to us in the long run. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we said, you know, this is actually all you really need to know about finance. And we created, it was quite a grandiose title. It was the only article you ever need to read on finance because this would give you the starting point. Yeah. And we said, look, there, there, there's three factors. There were the fact that we felt wasn't included was inflation. And, you know, it's very important in South Africa to understand what inflation is doing to your money. And I think if you look at Japan, for instance, where the stock market has been artificially inflated for the last two months, um, it has a real impact on wealth, but you've got to understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just thought it was a really fun way of saying there are three concepts out there Get your head around them and you'll get wealthy. And it's all you say about the time value of money. And then these concepts are looking at the value of your money uh, in the future and potentially what it could be now, how you value that. And of course, how much money you could potentially make in the future. So it's looking at your money versus uh, a longer time scale, basically, mm -hmm. to undersee it. Look, I think, yeah, I mean, Mug makes that, uh, that point and I think it's very important. And um, look, we've got, it's no secret that we've got a very low savings uh, um, rate in South Africa. In fact, it's probably one of the worst in the world. And my view is that it stems precisely from the lack of understanding of these financial concepts. For example, I think you know, the basic strategy when you've got money to save is to make sure that the money coming in is more than the money going out. But you find people in a situation where uh, the money coming in is far less than the money going out, and the money going out is maybe towards a car, um, and you're paying 10% or 12% interest on it, and then you have, you know, you've put your money maybe in some in, uh, investment vehicle, and you're only getting 5% back. Yep. So I think that's also a classic example, and I think it's very prevalent in South Africa. Let's start with, I suppose, the most basic of them all, Gareth, inflation. Uh, and bottom line is if you're not earning enough of a return to cover for what inflation is right now, you're losing money. In real terms, absolutely. And the, and the ch challenge with inflation is that it's a random redistribution of wealth. So as much as inflation, we have a rate, and we expect in South Africa about 5.66%, uh, differs around the world. In Zimbabwe, I won't even go into the numbers. There's not, there's not enough screen space for them. Um, in the US, it's quite low, 2 to 3%. Um, these numbers are fairly meaningless. Um, they're just a percentage that we've got to at least earn to stay steady. The trouble is that it's not always 
distributed evenly. Not everyone gets affected by the same five or six percent every year. Mm -hmm. So your specific industry, your specific firm might find devalue, devalues faster or slower and you've got to get behind those kind of risks. Mm -hmm. Inflation is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, and I mean, I think one of the things we, 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 we put into a table where you look at real returns, and there, there's, if you look in the last, I think it's eight years, four of them, you've actually had no real return. The only time you've actually made a real return has been from the stock market where it's done double digits, sort of 10, 15, 20%. And, you know, exactly to Gareth's point, if you weren't in that, you're actually going backward, and it doesn't matter, it may be your prop maybe your property is kind of keeping inflation. Everything else, you're going backwards, and you may feel richer because your paycheck's going up. But, I mean, you look at the, the cost of living and you know that you're actually going backwards. So, Stephen, let's bring you into the conversation. Um, is there still, still a place for, uh, for asset classes, for bonds, for cash and everything uh, that earns below inflation right now? And, of course, we're talking about the average inflation rate. Yes, uh, there's, there's really two aspects to investing. I mean, the one is uh, to get your, your risk profile right. So, for a long-term investor, we know that uh, in the past, equities over, over almost every long-term period have beaten bonds and cash, and even property in, in South Africa. If you look internationally over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, bonds have done very well, slightly better than equities, but equities have still done well. Coming back to the real return, even in the US, you've got about a 5 to 6% real return from equities over 30 years. Um, so as a long-term investor, as uh, Mark and everyone's been saying, you want to own equities. But also, you want to be diversified because we don't have a crystal ball into the future. So you want to diversify your portfolio so you're going to have some lower lows and also some lower highs. But uh, I certainly wouldn't advocate owning one asset class only, but I certainly would agree that you want to be skewed towards equities for the long run and balance that between domestic and international. Okay. Let's, let's delve into a little bit more complex uh, issue and that of compound interest, uh, the compounding effect. You've got uh, it being a positive if you're earning money on it mm -hmm. and a negative if you're accumulating debt. So you, you think it's, it's self-explanatory. And I mean, one of the examples we use, I love looking at this graph all the time. Alan Gray, run a, they, they got a running total on, the, on it. And if you put 10,000 into one of their investments in June 1974, today, compounded, dividends reinvested, it's worth nine, um, 114 odd million rand. I mean, I can tell you now, if you had 140 million rand in your pocket, you would retire very, very, very comfortably. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we don't ever get to that point. Very few South Africans would have, A, the discipline, but would they have the 10,000 available to invest in at, at that period in time? In 1974, obviously 10,000 rand was a lot of money. Um, but we don't, that, that highlights the benefit of compounding. But in the article, we look, we look at a couple of different tables and you can actually see the income is, is not going anywhere and the, the cost of living is going up. So that's ultimately eating into the, the ability to generate compounded returns. And I think that what that graph does show is that if you're disciplined enough, you keep your, your costs low and your expenses low, and I mean, I'm sure Stephen will have a view on, on, on long-term impact of costs, um, you can end up going quite, you, you can end up building very significant wealth very, very easily. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, the, the issue with compound is it also highlights the fact that uh, a marginal difference in the rate of return uh, over time makes a big difference. Exactly. So, so the key thing for me that comes out of understanding compounding effects is that the period in which you hold the investment is crucial. So if you're making a 1% or 2% difference between investment 1 and investment 2 over the next 2 or 3 years, it's probably not a huge amount in terms of dollar terms or rand returns. But spread out over 10 to 15 years, it can be double or triple. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really significant. And, and every investment strategy you read or hear about on long-term stocks suggests you buy and hold, and not necessarily a particular stock, but you have a pool of money that goes into an asset class and you hold it for a long time, Yeah, you know, 20 years plus. And there the small differences add up to significant multiples of return. Stephen, give us your view on, on the magic, really, of, of compounding, um, and uh, I suppose uh, you, how you need to take that into account when you're looking at debt, also from a longer term perspective. Well, I think uh, I would, uh Simplify compounding equals leverage. So it magnifies a good decision and it also magnifies a bad decision. And it's all about the long run because as Gareth said, in the short run, you're relatively unimpacted by paying an extra one or two percent. But uh, if you make a good long-term decision, investment decision or financing decision, then it just amplifies over the long run. The investment industry has been pretty good at uh, telling you about compounding returns and they've been lousy about telling you the opposite side of the coin is if you compound fees, it has the same impact. 
Uh, and uh, as has been mentioned, uh, I mean, just simplistically, if you save 1% in fees over 40 years, you're going to have 40% more money plus compounded. So you're going to get close to 50%. You know, 2% does, does more than double that. That's what compounding means, is that the long-term impact is disproportionately larger than the simple two numbers that you're looking at. Um, and the same is true for debt. If you make uh, uh, a, a bad decision on debt, then it's going to have the same impact. And as was mentioned earlier, what people don't know is what should I pay for debt? And that has to link to what I'm going to earn on my investment. Mm -hmm. Now, a balanced portfolio has given you about 5% per annum real after inflation over time, but that's before fees. So if you're paying 2% in fees, you're getting 3% net investor return. So now when you've got a financing decision, you've got to say, well, why would I finance a TV at 20% uh, real if it's an unsecured lending at 25% rate, less 5% inflation, 20% real, when I'm only earning 2 or 3% on my pension fund? It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important point. How do you demand higher rates, though? Because this is the big issue, and you even highlighted here, you know, bank uh, on the side of the road indicating, you know, get great rates, 4.75% return on an investment. And, of course, if it's below inflation or a very small number relative to what you are paying out in your debt, uh, you could lose out. Yeah, I mean, very uh, quick side, side jump to that. So now you're saying here's, a, here's an investment product that's offering you 4.75% return and inflation, and let's call it six for round numbers. Now, if you ask, if you went to the bank, they would tell you that's a defensive product. But actually, if you think about it, and, and, and this is sort of a side debate to all of this, is mm -hmm. that actually that's an aggressive product because they're actually taking an aggressive risk on whether or not it's, it, it's risky mm. to what you're doing. You're not really keeping, uh, and, and that was part of the, the point of understanding inflation was it actually impacts your long term. Uh, you, you have to understand what you're being sold in, in all of this. So I think that, but exactly to Stephen's point, if, you know, do you really want to be paying a TV off over five or ten years? I mean, how many people look around you, uh, you know, a house, for instance, how much does your house actually cost you over a 20-year period? You actually pay for it two or three times over, mm -hmm. but you think it's a good investment. Mm. Um, you know, we always have this debate. Because the issue around interest and the compounding for effect. For sure. And mm. the difference would have been that if you, you know, I saw a fantastic example this morning. Um, guy's 28 years old, he's got 600k in savings in the bank, he can put a 600k as a bond down and, and, and he's got cheap debt then. Mm -hmm. If he has to go and finance that same million over 20 years, he pays 2.7 million. I mean, it, it, it's, it's the real value of money that you're sitting here. And I think that that kind of brings you to the last point, which is ultimate your DCF, is what mm -hmm. is the real cash flow that comes in out of any investment and what can you realize for it right now? Yeah, and that, of course, relates to entrepreneurs especially because uh, you talk about the fact that unlisted companies in South Africa don't generally uh, fetch high multiples in South Africa or multiples below 10. Uh, but if you're using the discounted cash flow model, you can sell your business given the fact that you can project future earnings a lot better for a lot higher multiple. Mm. Do you want to take this? Guy? Yeah, I'll take it. So, so what we see in um, private companies is they're hard to compare. So people typically use a couple of different multiples. Um, they're very hard to find comparable multiples. And, and although multiple is very easy to compute, you know, you say six times profit after tax gives you a price. If you look at the reliability of the multiple, it, it doesn't hold up to any kind of real testing. There's just not enough comparables. You don't have enough uh, insight into the financials of those firms or their situations. So only the discounted cash flow allows you to interrogate the future. And I make the point in the article that you can have two, two identical businesses, the same financials at the same point of time. They will face different futures. Only a DCF allows you to do that calculation. Let's do the layman's thing. Tell us how the discounted cash flow works. All right. You look at the cash flows that the firm generates over the next uh, three to five years, and then plus a period after that, which you do some fairly simple but uh, conceptually great maths around that just call it the terminal value. And you work those back to the current value by discounting them to compensate for the risk, which includes inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the risk of that business going under, the risk of a competitor moving in, the risk of traffic moving away, customer going under, you know, there's a, th there's a thousand risks. Yeah. So that at least asks you the questions that force you to think about the particular business. Mm -hmm. And the result is that you have a number that allows you to compare whether you spend a million rand on a business or put a million rand into the long term investments in the market and so on. Yeah, I mean, maybe as an example, so like I agree with you, the math sounds intimidating when you, when you look at it, when you look at it, and, and it is a concept, it's not something you can just sort of plug into Excel and say, here's your formula for mm -hmm. it, but you can get your head around the math. But so you, we use the example of ShopRite in the, um, in the article itself. So for every rand that ShopRite genera generates in revenue, 3.6 cents is profit. 
I mean, that's nothing. Mm -hmm. that, that is as razor thin as you get. Now, imagine you're running a retail business, so, and, but people buy into ShopRite and they pay 25 times earnings because they know what ShopRite's cash flow is. It's transparent. You can kind of work it. And they've got the skill. And they've got the skill. It, 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 it yeah. goes to their benefit. But if you were trying to run the same retail business in a, a little sort of franchise or, or side retail business, you're lucky if you're going to get seven times multiple on it. Um, and, and that's where, you, if you understand what cash is being generated now and what's going to be generated down the line, I, I think you can, it, it genuinely gives you a very different picture. And I think mm -hmm. you can get a, your investment changes from seven times earnings to 25 times earnings. Yeah, I mean, just looking at, uh, Stephen, just looking at the, uh, the article by the Goldman Sachs banker talking about the fact that he was a bond salesman and, of course, using uh, DCFs often uh, in, in the valuation of bonds. Um, but, but how can DCF and that whole model be applied right now? I mean, you talk about entrepreneurs. Give us other examples of why it's so valuable in our lives. Uh, well, I think that uh, it's not just the DCF because uh, you need to understand two things for a DCF. You need to understand the cash flows. So as uh, Mark alluded to, you've got to have how much confidence do you have in, in predicting cash flows. And someone like ShopRite with, I'm not sure, but several hundred stores uh, and a proven business model, uh, it's much easier to predict that than someone with one store. Uh, and then the discount rate, that relates to the real, the real interest rate and the risk-free rate. And, and people, a lot of people don't understand the risk-free rate, but that really, you can take a government bond that's about 7% yield, less inflation of 5%, it's a 2% real yield. And that's important to understand because it's what you should be prepared to pay for an asset, but also what interest you should be prepared to pay to a bank. So I think the underlying principles of a DCF are very important, as has been mentioned. The actual calculation is a bit more complicated, but if you get those two principles right, you're going to make much better long-term decisions. And talk to us about your view on financial gravity. Uh, well, that pretty much is financial gravity, is, is to say that uh, you get finite returns out of investing in, uh, in financial assets. They're not unlimited. A lot of people think that there's some magic wand that's been waved. And financial gravity says that in the long run, as an owner of an asset, uh, there's a finite return that you can expect to receive. And that's linked to the risk-free rate, which I mentioned is about 2% real. So owning shares in the long run, you get about 7% real. That's what you've got 6-7% in most financial markets over the long run. So if someone promises you a return of uh, 10 or 15% real, then that's defying financial gravity. And you've really got to question how is that coming about? Um, if you don't know what a sensible real return is, then you're not going to be able to interpret whether an investment with a very high rate of return is speculative or, or not. And in South Africa, we've fallen for so many of these uh, high return uh, investments and people simply aren't educated enough to say, well, hang on a second, how are you doing this? And the only way that you can achieve an above average return is if you take an above average risk. And that could be through leverage or whatever other means. And by knowing financial gravity, you'll know what kind of return to expect on your investment and also what you should be paying away on your debt. Well, we'll leave it at that. And of course, if you'd like to read more on this topic, the top secret uh, three things that you need to know when it comes to financial uh, math, you can, of course, read the FinWeek cover story this week. But thanks so much to Gareth Ush from evaluationup.com and Stephen Nathan, Chief Executive of 10X Investments, joining us from our Cape Town studios. Well, it's time now for a quick look at the FinWeek trade of the week. Well, this week's trade of the week is Purple Capital. When I last checked, it's trading at 21 cents, but this is a company that's been turning itself around. Yeah, I mean, uh, so it's a little bit of a selfish one. It is the start of the rugby season, and um, we, we, you know, a couple of us are very interested in the whole sports betting side of, of, of Purple Capital. So ultimately, it's broken into three main parts. It's the Global Trader Business, or GT247. Uh, it's VaultBet, which is a sports business, and then it is the um, Treasury Business, which has got there. And you know, it, it, it's gone through some really tough times. I mean, it, if you look back at the chart about five years ago, I think it was around two rand eighty. It's now trading at twenty cents, and it's one I've been punting for a while as, mm -hmm. as a bit of a turnaround. If you look at it, why? I, I, th I like the management of it. I mm -hmm. think they've got some quite cool brands there. I think they're, they're doing some interesting things. Certainly quite charismatic. Charismatic. Uh, CEO. Yes, we won't we won't discuss <laughs> their dress sense uh, right now. But um, you know, they are they are charismatic. I think they do have interesting brands. I think they've spent a lot of time investing in it. 
it. I mean, it has gone from, it, it, you know, they're sitting with about 63 million in cash in the bank at the moment. Mm -hmm. They haven't been rushed into making it. You know, when you looked at the old purple, it felt like a bits and pieces have been cobbled together. Now you've got some quite clear parts to this business. Mm -hmm. um, the GT business makes money. Uh, treasury business kind of up and down. It's interesting, it's one of the biggest treasury businesses outside of the big four banks. And then the vault bit, which is the sports betting one, is one of those ones that does seem to be getting some traction. And they've also got Global Trader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. within, G within uh, GT. So they've got the, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the local and the um, and, and they've kind of putting together some nice little things there. And it's a profitable, the GT business is profitable. I think mm -hmm. that's kind of still the engine that drives it. Why would you buy Purple Capital and not buy an, a bank or another financial stock? No, I think you... It has the capacity to turn around from, from these levels. I mean, you, you know, it, it really got weighed down with quite a big debt load. Um, you know, they've managed to skin down the NOV quite a lot now. Uh, interesting sum on it is, so I think the NOV sits about 21 cents, but the TINA, which is tangible net asset value, is much lower. It's somewhere, I think it's about five or six. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there's still some intangible sitting in there. But it, it's got positive cash flow again. It looks like it's moving from, uh, you know, it's cutting back its losses, it's cut back its debt, it's got real cash in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, it just feels like the, it, it's getting to that point where it's a, a standalone business. And I think that one, that they're investing quite a lot in these other, you know, specifically the vault bet, the sports betting thing. You, you get the sense that it is getting traction. And, you know, th they've been quite marketing savvy in the last couple of years. Well, there we go. That's the one for you. If you're looking to, to bet on a, a smaller cap financial company, time to pay the bills. We'll be straight back after this short break. Welcome back to Finweek Money Matters. Uh, while the global financial crisis has rocked the South African property market, we do continue to have a vibrant rental market which is attractive to those able to invest in property at the moment. Now, property syndication has uh, proven a popular method for getting involved in the sector, but with a number of high-profile blowouts, we'll take a look at factors to consider before clubbing together and buying property. Michelle Dickens, uh, Managing Director of TPN, Craig Schaffer, Partner at Bauman Gilfillian, and of course, Tandy Cizwe and Mark still with me at the desk. Thanks so much for joining us. Michelle, I'll start off with you. Uh, talk to us about the rental market right now. Is it buoyant? Well, the rental market for both commercial and residential is buoyant. There's a high number of vacancies though in commercial market, whereas we're seeing some stock constraints in the residential market, and that's pushing prices up, which is nice for landlords. Um, payment profiles are also good. So we're seeing in the residential market that 82% of tenants are in good standing. Um, in the commercial market, uh, similarly 82%, although um, in the commercial market you're going to find it takes longer to, co to collect your rent. So there's a lot um, bigger portion of that in the late, late payment category. Mm -hmm. If you look at SA retail market at the moment, residential market at the moment, I mean, is, is it the case that people don't want to buy houses or they can't buy houses? That, that, that's meaning that they're actually sitting there as rental tenants rather than uh, homeowners? I, th I think what has happened is that there was a big drive in the buy to let market um, in the 2006-2007 period mm -hmm. and a lot of those um, uh, buy to let investors had over leveraged. So there was a drop off, um, they were trying to deleverage, um, lose some properties and um, there hasn't been a big um, drive back into that market with buy to investors buying uh, back into that market. Also there hasn't been a lot of development mm -hmm. um, from developers so stock has dried up in terms of opportunities to buy a new uh, buy to let property. In popular areas at the moment? Um, obviously location, location, location. Mm. So Western Cape is a great place to be investing in properties. Tenants in the Western Cape are fabulous. From a rental perspective. From a rental perspective. Tenants in the Western Cape are fabulous uh, tenants. Um, Why is that? Uh, one, one, one would wonder, but there, there are a couple of answers. Um, Western Cape, um, your um, average income in the Western Cape is, annual income is quite nice, as it is in Gauteng, whereas in the Western Cape, your uh, credit lend per person is much lower than it is in Gauteng. So in Gauteng we have people that are much more overextended from um, a tenant perspective. So even though their income is high, they have much bigger commitments. So we end up seeing that the Gauteng tenants are the worst performing mm -hmm. um, in the country. Interesting. So we're over indebted here in, in Gauteng. 
uh, property syndication, is it being driven uh, by uh, the fact that the, the retail market, there's opportunity there to get an income through grouping your money together, pulling, pulling your money together, and of course investing in a property? Yes, of course, uh, pull your money together as you minimize your risk. The risk is spread over a, you know, a, a group of people. Um, also um, gives you greater uh, flexibility with what you can actually invest in. Um, but that's not to say it's completely without risk. It's got to be carefully structured.